Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of the Irish Tennis Updates podcast. Today I'm lucky enough to be chatting to probably the most successful Irish player in recent times, Connor Nyland. I was really excited to get to talk to Connor. We talked about where tennis started for him, his transition into the Pro Tour, how he looks back on his Wimbledon and US Open heroics today, his thoughts on Irish tennis today, and much more. I really hope you enjoy this chat, so let's get into it. All right, so Connor, if you could have one superpower, what would you choose and why? Well, I did a lot of traveling uh, on the tour, and uh, I think the f- uh, flying would have been a nice one, um, <laughs> get around quicker, and uh, I uh, um, I wouldn't mind getting away for a few days at the moment, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> uh, all this this lockdown is uh, is tough going, but um, hopefully there's light at the end of the tunnel. But yeah, flying that would be my uh, that would be my pick. Probably a probably a boring answer, but yeah, it would make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it'd be easy to so- to be socially distant up in the air. I'd say you, you wouldn't have any worries about that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if Leo would would allow it or something. <laughs> um, yeah. So how how how's life at the moment? How are you getting on with with the lockdown? Yeah, look at it's um, it's fine. Like we've got two toddlers at home, and we're both working, so it's uh, we're trying to juggle a few things, um, but. Uh, Look, I was thinking the other day. It's not not unlike being at a at an old satellite event uh, back in the back on the tour, where you're kind of in the same place for for four weeks, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, spending a lot of time with the courts and at your hotel. Um, so, look, I think us tennis players are are probably a bit more used to to it than others, just being in kind of a bit of a a bit of a simple lockdown life for a few weeks. So that's it's fine. You know, hopefully, hopefully we get out of this in a, in a few weeks and uh, things get back to, to a little bit more more normality. You know, that's the, that's that's the hope. Yeah, for sure. Like, how do you see uh, pro tennis looking when it comes back? Do you see it looking different in any way to to what it's been? Any changes? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's well. I think it's going to be a gradual thing, and I think probably some countries perhaps are going to be opened up before others. And I saw the other day that um, Germany, I think, are cancelling all sort of sporting events and concerts, major sporting events and concerts, until September. So nice. that means your Ham- your Hamburg opens and your Stuttgart and that are, are and their Halles are gone now. Um, so. I guess you know. I suppose there's there's a couple of st- you know, a couple of tiers to the to the pro tour. You've got your futures that probably don't have a lot of spectators, but whether the ITF are willing to bring those back, um, you know, I would have thought you're looking at the end of the year for, for for things to start getting back into the swing of things. And as I say, if it's staged and gradual, then that means that certain countries um, who put on the futures events are probably going to have loads of loads of entries and loads of guys playing so they're going to be com- very competitive so perhaps yeah. the cuts are going to be a little bit lower so maybe you would have gotten in at 400 before but it's going to be a three 350 or 250 cut even for futures because guys just want to get back playing so look at we're all guessing and speculating i feel sorry for a lot of the players both obviously guys who are looking to make a move over the next couple of years ranking wise but also just in terms of how they manage their training and time like i see you know some players are really looking at the physical and saying, look, this is a two or three week physical block that I don't usually get. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, how do you peak and and structure that training so that you're ready to go? Like you don't, just don't know when the, you don't know when the right, the light's going to go green, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just, a, it's a tricky time. It really is. I think that's it as well, that you don't know when it's going to end. You just, you don't, you don't have that, that, that you know, that, that first tournament in sight to mm-hmm. even aim for. So it does make it much trickier. Yeah, and, and depending on where you're based, you know, if your home is is uh, a certain country or a certain town, you know, you're just not getting access to to anything really. But let's say you're based in in Florida, you know, or, or Barcelona, you can probably get in a few um, uh, training sessions that you wouldn't get, you know, depending on where you're from, where your home yeah. is. So look at it, uh, it. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of guys just trying to, to, to just don't, trying to work through this. And hopefully, in sort of maybe six, six, six weeks or so, we'll have a bit more clarity. Yeah, that's it. It's tough times, but um, I just want to open up that question a bit more. So, how's life been for you? I guess since you retired. So, how's how have you been uh, doing the last few years? Yeah, well, it's been eight years, believe it or not. Um, almost to the day, actually. Uh, it was April, <laughs> so uh, April twenty twelve, um, and. Uh, yeah, look, it's 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 been been fine. Like I suppose I went to college in the states, um, 
you know, finished obviously my schooling education and then college in the States. So, you know, I wasn't sort of out on the tour at 16 or 17 and then yeah. uh, in my early 30s trying to figure out what to do. So uh, it was a bit more of a natural um, ease back into to normal life, I suppose. Um, and uh, yeah, I went back and did a master's um, and, uh, and, and and had of stayed coaching and, and I'm the Davis Cup captain now. So I'm still involved in tennis, but it's more on a kind of a part time basis. Um, and uh, yeah, as I say, um, a small uh, young family now um, as well. So uh, plenty to keep me busy. Um, but it would be not, it'd be lovely to get away to uh, um, you know a few of the the bigger tournaments. I'd love to stay involved that way. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I, I did a lot of traveling when I was playing, so um, I don't see that happening for uh, for the foreseeable. Yeah, and like I know one thing you're you're involved in with the moment is tennis for cancer. So how? Um, hmm. So is would, would you want to just tell me what, what what that's about a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Grace Owens, um, who's based out of uh, out of Monkstown, um, Monkstown Tennis Club uh, member, and she's a coach as well, um, approached me um, a couple of years ago about becoming a patron um, of Tennis for Cancer. I lost my dad to, to cancer in 2013, um, and uh, he was uh, he was a obviously he was a he was a great influence on my life, and and yeah. And really helped me with my tennis career, and was uh, was a brilliant sort of coach and mentor for me. Um, and uh, so, obviously, when Grace asked me, I immediately wanted to get involved. And I thought it was a great concept as well. It's uh, essentially any club um, can put on any type of event, and essentially the entry fee is whatever you want it to be. Um, so it can okay. be a fiver or a hundred euro, um, and all that money uh, goes to Tennis for Cancer and Tennis for Cancer. Um, has two uh, beneficiaries, um, uh, Breast Cancer Research and uh, ARC, which is a, a cancer support services um, charity in Ireland. So they kind of, they cover both things, you know, the, the, the research side where you're sort of, I suppose, looking for something that, that might help those in the future and then the support services, which are helping those yeah. who are dealing with cancer in the, in the present. So, uh, and obviously it's something that, it can be done anywhere at any scale it can be 10 people in a club or 200 um and, and malahide raised about like twenty thousand euro last year at an event wow. it's incredible yeah. um and but you know you can you can do 500 euro and would be would be delighted as well so that's a great thing and obviously we're having having to, to rethink how we how we look how we look at um the charity in the next few months because uh, obviously everything shut down so yeah. um but yeah it's something i'm involved in and love uh, love it love being a part of it yeah so it's a great cause for sure so it's a really good thing to have going on um i, I just want to go yeah. back to kind of tennis i guess your tennis tennis journey so how did tennis uh, start for you in the first place so i was the the youngest of four uh, children um and we uh, we uh, we lived in the uk uh, for a few years my dad's work uh, took him over there so um I was born in Birmingham in England and my eldest sister Gina and my two brothers Ross and Ray started tennis over there. We lived across the road and I mean literally across the road from uh, Edgebass and Priory which is one of the great clubs uh, in Britain that's got a WTA event um, as a pre-Wimbledon uh, a pre-Wimbledon event um, and indoor courts and outdoor courts and all that so um, my sister got involved there and my mum had played growing up at a quite good level like she would have played Fitzwilliam and she played for Connacht and uh, right. And my dad hadn't played tennis, but he had uh, he'd been a Gaelic footballer and was re- had a real interest in tennis. And he sort of sort of played a bit as well. Um, so we got really into it there. And uh, my sister, by the time we moved back to Ireland, I was three, and my sister was about uh, eleven or twelve, and she was one of the top two or three players in Britain under twelve. Okay. Um, so when we moved back to Ireland, we moved back to Limerick, um, and. Uh, um we got it with my dad we built a, uh, in, an artificial grass court in our back garden um so we played an awful lot of tennis out there growing up um uh, i used to play monday to friday with my mum about 30 minutes or so and then at the weekends i'd play with my brothers and sister and my my dad um uh, so not, not a huge not huge hours but just did a lot of um sort of um, steady sort of work um most days and it was uh, yeah it was a great sort of tennis education for me yeah, so you obviously then kept with it and took it really seriously. So I'm interested in, in what are some of the, the overriding memories you have from kind of junior days playing tennis? Yeah, I had a lot of, uh, a lot of great times playing. Uh, we, we, we were members of Limerick Lawn Tennis Club, so um, we used to get um, 
about it was about 15 minutes away and we'd go over and sometimes you'd just be left at the at the gate for at nine o'clock in the morning and not be picked up till till six or five six o'clock that uh, that evening and yeah. just you know you just you know hang around the club and there was a sweet shop across the road and you know you'd run across there and come back you know so yeah lots of kind of fun fun times and then um as i started to get a little bit older started to play tournaments around limerick and cork um and then started to go to dublin in the summers so we'd play like five or six events in dublin um you know from the time you're sort of under 11 under 12 um so yeah lo- and loads of great memories made loads of great friends um and took it seriously but at the same time played lots of other sports and uh you know had my wins had my losses and it was a great uh um it was a great time yeah, so then you went off to, to college in the States, you said, at, at, after school. Um, so how was how were those years over there? Kind of How did they develop you as, as a player and, and a person, I guess? Yeah, so I so just rewind a little bit, I suppose. I went to yeah. boarding school in, in England after my junior cert um, and did three years there um, at a place called Millfield School, uh, which had an affiliation with Nick Bollettieri's Tennis Academy. Um, okay. uh, so there was a coach for Bollettieri's in the school and they had five... Um, full-time coaches three indoor courts um and some good facilities so yeah, that was yeah. a, a kind of a good stepping stone for me I, I suppose in hindsight um a barcelona or a Bollettieri's in florida might have been a better uh move from a purely tennis perspective um which would have been a little bit more so it's competitive and, and a higher higher level um but i suppose it was more of a natural step for me to go to millfield and did three years there and then i took yeah. a year off after millfield and did a year on the tour um i uh, went down to australia new zealand south africa did a sort of a tour um and got to 800 in the world um, and then played davis cup um for ireland against croatia um was my debut and the coach was peter wright who's the berkeley Dave, berkeley coach still is the Berkeley coach um, and he offered me a, a full scholarship to, to Berkeley so um, after my year on the tour okay. I went there um, and did four four years and had a, had a brilliant time um, it was it was good I mean I, I, I often say I think a tennis player is sort of at 18 19 20 pretty much at the level they're going to be at like obviously you can improve but you know it's rare to have somebody who's at a certain level and then just all of a sudden just comes on leaps and bounds like it does happen occasionally um yeah. so you know I, I suppose for me there's a lot of maintenance work that goes on between 20 and 24 um, and you can pick up a couple of things and improve and that's kind of what happened at berkeley i just kept improving and worked very hard and added a couple of things so that i was then ready to to go out on the tour and, and get up to sort of 200 250 uh, relatively quickly after my college days yeah, so how did you find that transition um, into the proper pro tour? It sounds like you did pretty well, pretty quick. How, how, how did how did that how did you find that? Yeah, I got up to four hundred like within three months. Um, nice. So I was three in the I was three in the NCA rankings in college, and then so I knew I was kind of a 200, 250 type player. So once I uh, went on the tour, my yeah my futures and uh, uh, and that results were very very strong. Um, so got up to that level. It took me a while to go from say. 300 to top 200 that future to challenger winning matches at the challenger level consistently um took me probably a year and a half or so and there was an injury or two in there as well yeah. um and uh but eventually kind of got cracked top 200 um I was pretty close to cracking top 200 in 2008 i won a challenger in, in india but then i was out for three months i tore a cartilage in my hip um and that sort of put my ranking back and obviously T- delayed my, my my I suppose my um my ranking jump um for for about a year um but then got back to top 200 then sort of 2010 um and then had a couple of years in and around 100 150 um 100, 129 is my best ranking but um but yeah it was I suppose yeah I'd say college tennis allowed me to get to the keep a level where I was able to jump through the futures quite quickly um, as opposed to being 19, 20, 21 playing futures I was kind of doing college while getting that sort of level yeah yeah um, I'm interested what, what's your your proudest achievement from uh, from tour life I suppose the obvious answer would be you know playing in Wimbledon and getting to Wimbledon and, and, and yeah. the US Open um, uh, there are things that's people still remember and uh, i'll always have that which is great um 
I suppose the one that maybe you wouldn't think as much of is winning won the Israel Open, which is a hundred thousand dollar challenger. Yeah. Um in twenty ten. Um and beat uh, beat some some good players like Rainer Shuttler who was a hundred was was about seventy in the world at the time that week. Nice. Um Tiago Alves who was about hundred and ten or something. So beat some beat some really good players. Um, I think maybe all the players that beat I beat that week were top hundred at some time in their career. Um, okay. So that was that was a big deal for me, and uh, kind of pushed me up to about 160 in the world. So that was uh, that was a big jump from about 220 to 160, or whatever it was. So that kind of brought me up to another level. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, Wimbledon there. I just want to ask quickly about that. I'm interested in in, in what your your overriding your how you look back on that now, because obviously you know you could look back at it with regret that you didn't end up winning the match. But I think the the memory I have from it was you know the unbelievable Irish support that was there. Um, you know the amount of support that was there for you. So, how do you look back on that now, if you think about it? Yeah, you're you're, you're absolutely right. Um, there's there's a couple of ways of looking at it, and I think you have to choose the positive. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember when I, mean, I remember when I first came off the court. Um, obviously, the first people I went to were my family, and and their reaction to it and how positive they were really helped my um, perspective on it. Um, they were. They thought it was, you know, a great performance, and it was four hours, and it was. I was there, thereabouts. Um, you know, I could have gone out and lost two, two, and two, and have yeah. been over in an hour and a half. Um, obviously, the fact that I was up in the fifth set meant that I still have regrets, and I would be lying if I said I didn't um, think about that match quite often, and, and 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 how nice it would have been to play. Every time I look at centre court, I think I wish I'd played on that court. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. disappointed I didn't. Um, but look, that's that's sport, and if you're playing Gaelic football and you lose an All Ireland semi final, I bet every time you look at Croke Park, you think I wish I'd, you know. Won. Yeah. So look at it. It's just the, that's just the nature of the piece. So um, I'm I'm fine with it. Um, and then I obviously got to play on a big court at the US Open against Djokovic, um, which helped um, as well. So I was able to sort of sort of tick a box and say I played on a on a major centre court uh, in my career, which is you know from. Uh, from Limerick, I suppose. Um, if somebody had told me that when I was eleven or twelve, I don't think yeah. I would have believed them. So I was ha- happy, happy with that. Yeah, no, massive achievement. Um, and just about that U.S. Open, obviously, it would have been a different type of disappointment that you know it was out of your hands. You couldn't compete your best that day. How do you look on that compared, you know, in in, in a different way to the Wimbledon experience? Yeah, a little, again, I suppose again a little bit bittersweet uh, in a different way. Uh, yeah, a bit frustrating and a bit. Uh, almost confusing about how something like that could happen um but at the same time i got out there and played um, yeah. and uh, i would have you know probably you know lost in straight sets anyway so um you know i think um it's just one of those things again i, I look at the positives on it and there's loads of positives i had an amazing week um and uh, uh you know loads to take from it and I suppose um it's something I can always say, um, and that's you know that's a big part of it. So look, uh, again, a very positive thing. And I was down match points in Wimbledon qualifying, um, which probably not people don't know. I think I might have saved five match points in the first round of qualifying <laughs> there you go. against Jocelyn Oana. Um, you know, uh, I was down a set in the last round of qualifying at US Open. So look, I could be sitting here as a guy who was 150 in the world and never played a grand slam main draw so i'm I'm taking it as a positive (laughs) yeah 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 i mean like to qualify for two slams especially in a row you know it's a a remarkable level to get to and an achievement to get them you know to to, to win those three matches and it was all i think it was all tight matches those those qualifying matches you won so it was some, some really good wins yeah some good wins but um um yeah well and and wimbledon so yeah my first two matches um, in Wimbledon qualifying, I think we're through. We're 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 one in the third set. I know the first one certainly was. I think the second one was against Greg Jones. Last round qualies was best of five sets, and I won that in straight sets. But it took right. it took it took like two or even three days to complete because of rain. Okay. So it was a really um, it was a, it was a mad um, it was Nikola Mektic actually um, the Croatian. He won he won um, Aussie Open mix this year. He's he's kind of a, a double specialist, but. Oh, yeah. uh, and then, yeah, Matthew, uh, Matt Way, middle coop, three in three sets last round, qualies US Open. I actually played on grandstand in my second round qualies in US Open, which is no longer there, but it was a really cool court. 
Um, and that was actually straight sets. And the first round, I think, was straight sets as well. So I, I think I was, for a year or so, I, was, I felt like I was definitely playing consistently at a top 100, even close to top 50 level. Um, now, my serve was never, never got me the cheap points and kind of held me back, I think, from going up another level. But kind of ball striking wise, and that I, for a couple of years, I, I felt like I was really right there at a kind of a yeah. world level. So that was, you know, that was cool. Yeah, if I was to ask for your best memory, would it be something we've just mentioned, or would you have something else to say was your best memory from tour? Um, from the from the tour, um, like I suppose the the, the the challenger win stick in my mind, but yeah, definitely match point against Mekdish to qualify for Wimbledon was was it was uh, a special feeling, um, yeah. and uh, yeah, and I suppose you feed off other people's reaction as well, and the messages and that from home was of genuine excitement, and um, yeah, it just felt like a very uh, it was a very kind of rich time, I suppose, in terms of those week or so, that week or so, in terms of your, um, your the messages you're getting from people and and that it was just yeah it was, it was amazing. So yeah, there, there's nothing really that comes close. And obviously US Open, I got a little bit of that, but it still wasn't quite the same level. Wimbledon has that special place in everyone's yeah. heart, I suppose, and uh, connects with people. So I, I, I thought I felt uh, I felt great. Yeah. On the other side of it, what was the biggest challenge you had to overcome? Do you think? It was tough. It was t- it's t- tour is tough. Um, it's tough traveling traveling thirty weeks a year um, uh, with either on your own, which I try to avoid, or one coach. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not a lot of crack, I suppose. Um, <laughs> sadly, um, and that's why you see guys like Murray and Djokovic and Federer when they can afford it, having kind of eight nine people around. And that's why Davis Cup is so much fun because there's eight yeah. nine people around at dinner. But uh, you know, one on one you know third week in you know and obviously it's all about how you look at it and, and you can be negative about it and say it's really tough or you can look at the bright side and say look it's a privilege to be going and playing around the world but there's both sides to it and there's gray areas in life and <laughs> it's uh it's tough at times um and when you're losing in the first second round a lot it's really tough like the sport's great when you're winning in a, in a, in a tennis tournament you know, half the people lose in the first round um, yeah. and then another half get cold in the second round. So, you know, most weeks you're you're having to, to pack the bags on the Wednesday or Thursday, unfortunately, even if you're very good. Um, so when you're winning, the tour is brilliant um, and it's great at the top level. But when you're struggling, um, it's 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 not easy. Yeah. Um, and if, if you could go back and, and do it all again, is there, is there anything you'd do differently? Well, if I look back at my kind of junior career and that, I only I only played about eight or nine ITFs and uh, and kind of maybe one or two futures that were in Ireland, um, and obviously was in Millfield. Um, so I think if I was to do it again, I think maybe at sixteen, um, you know, after my junior cert, um, I would have perhaps gone to a to a sort of a tennis academy and maybe done a, a slightly more flexible school schedule. Like I remember going to an ITF in morocco when i was in millfield and i think i got like detention when i came back because i missed too much school or something like you know so i was i was trying to sort of do that as well whereas you know so i think i think yeah if i was doing it all again i think maybe at 16 or so i would have gone to a volunteers or a barcelona um and then gone and played my 15 20 itfs because that's what most of the guys in the top 100 did and then i got about the option of going to college or not after yeah but I think yeah. that would have been a better stepping stone for me than than what I did. I don't get me wrong, Millfield was brilliant, but it was just for from a, from a purely tennis perspective, maybe not quite what I needed. Yeah. Um, what um, is is your favorite place you've ever played tennis? I mean, would you say Wimbledon, or is there some like obscure futures event that was in you know that was an amazing place? Would you have something else mm. to, to look at for, the, for your favorite place you've played tennis? There was. Um, uh, I used to I used to like going to um, Pepperdine uh, University in uh, in Los Angeles uh, in Malibu. Um, okay. That was uh, so we used to go down there and play, and a and a place called La Jolla in San Diego. We used to play a college event there. So those uh, again, both on the water and overlooking the water. Um, so we used to play a doubles tournament in in La Jolla every March, um, and uh, so it was a little bit more fun. Um, uh, so the college team used to go right down there. So that was. Uh, that was hard to beat. And also Athens in Georgia, which is where the NCAs 
uh, final 16 is uh, okay. was traditionally, and they've started, they've started to move it around in the last 10 years. Um, but they were they were really cool from a, from a college perspective. Um, and I had a great uh, I had a great time down in um, down in Australia and New Zealand when I was on that break um sorry when i was on that one year before i went to berkeley yeah myself and john doran and peter clark were on that trip um and uh, we had a great time it was three months we were in sort of we in around sydney and then we were in, in new zealand and um playing futures every week um but we had some with some really cool we were in like manly and sydney and homebush where the olympics were on and and you know that was uh, was a, that was a really cool trip actually yeah, um, just have a couple more questions for you. Um, what would be your number one piece of advice for junior players today? Um, I suppose it depends on, on the age, but um, I, I would say um, that you, somebody who's aspiring to a professional, let's say, you know, I'd be saying that you need to be getting um, you need to be getting away to international tournaments during the winter and the summer. So I'd be saying, you know, you need to be getting away to, to between five and ten international tennis Europe events every winter. Um, and stuff for themselves, figure out stuff for themselves rather than relying on a coach to have all the answers. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'd be saying is get out and compete um, and compete internationally if that's what you aspire to do when you're on the tour. Um, you're going to be competing against the best of the best from all around the world. So you should try and expose yourself to that from a young age uh, where possible. Yeah, and, and what's your opinion on, on Irish tennis at the moment, how it is, how it's doing? Uh, it's not great, um, to be honest. Um, it's kind of been the same for, for decades, really, in terms of our tournament structure. We don't have enough international tournaments. Um, so, you know, we've got... I don't know, one under 12 tennis Europe, maybe two under 14, none under 16. We've got three under 18. If you look at, you know, a Belgium or a Holland or a, you know, wherever they've got five of each or six of each, yeah. you know, um, so we're asking our players to, and we're on an island, so we can't, we can't travel around. So, um, you know, I'd love to see a few more events like that. I think that would make a big difference. Um, and there, you don't even need to, like it's not if, if you have to put on a futures you got to come up with the prize money but like you don't need that for the junior events we should just focus yeah. on on doing that um and then like more more indoor courts and more clay courts now i know that's harder to to deliver than some tennis tournaments like uh you know i think the tennis tournaments just are that difficult to deliver and that's what's frustrating um you know i think that would make a big difference um international tournaments hosted in Ireland um, for junior players, I think, would, would bridge that gap. Um, so, yeah, that was, that's something I'd like to see. Yeah. Um, and then finally, what, what's your favourite thing about tennis? Um, well, I loved about, always loved about tennis was that it was very kind of one-on-one -on -one and very fair and very black and white. Um, it was like you didn't have to rely on a coach to, or a manager to pick you or... Um, you didn't have to rely on teammates and you know it was as i say if you won or you lost it was it was fair and square generally and down to yeah. down to the person that won um and that's I, I, why i never connected with doubles um at all in my career um obviously did it and, was, um, and did it where i needed to do it but it just never yeah. would never did anything for me at all yeah um and uh you know it's funny but yeah the singles i felt like that was the essence of tennis um and almost the whole point of it um was that it was one on one and um and as i say uh write it down on the piece of paper you, you won or you lost and, and that's that so that's that's what i loved about it yeah great okay i think i'll leave it there so i, I really do appreciate your time and appreciate you you coming on and and talking uh th thanks thanks so much i hope you thanks adam I hope, I hope you stay well i hope you stay well and safe and get out of this the other side and just get back to normality in the, yeah, you too. In, in the, the not too distant future. Yeah, you too, and well done on uh, on the website and the, the updates and that. It's uh, it's a great resource for for all us Irish tennis fans. So um, we mightn't I mightn't like every single tweet you put up, uh, <laughs> as in physically like it or retweet it, but that doesn't mean I'm not reading them. Um, so uh, so well done, and uh, and keep up the great work. Well, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks very much. Many thanks once again to Connor for agreeing to talk to me and for giving up his time. 
Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please um, subscribe to the show so you don't miss an episode. Uh, Leave a review so more people can find out about the podcast. I hope you're all doing all right, coping okay with the lockdown. Until next time, I've been Adam. Stay safe. Goodbye.